This documentary assesses the significance of the Sutton Hoo ship burial, which was excavated in 1939 by Basil Brown. In this period known as the Dark Ages, we knew very little about what actually happened on the island of Great Britain and how people lived. Until Sutton Hoo, which changed everything for archaeology, for history and our opinions of this period. To follow us on a journey accessing the significance of the Sutton Hoo ship burial, in 1939. Sutton Hoo was first properly excavated in 1939 by Basil Brown after he was contacted by its official landowner Edith May Pretty concerning untold gold that was apparently present within the many mounds that lay proudly on her lands. The site contains in total about 20 mounds but by far the most impressive and significant is what is named Mound 1 where according to speculation the great Bretwalder King Raidwald was buried. Sutton Hoo was a turning point for British history in countless ways, and in this documentary, we explore why. We spoke to Lizzie Buckley, a famous Canadian archaeologist, about the specific significance of the artefacts found at Mound One, which were the helmet, the belt, the hanging bowl, the scepter, and coins found in a purse. The artifact Sutton Hoo completely changed the world's view of Anglo-Saxon England. It was thought to be the Dark Ages, where the island had no, or perhaps a small, but faltering economy. A time when nothing of quality was produced there, and the Germanic hordes ruled over the Britons without sophistication. Although there were a variety of artifacts found, the mound that best displays the significance of the archaeological finds is Mount One. This burial, thought to be that of the great warrior King Redwald of the East Angles, displays an excellent array of artifacts. The significance of these is their quality and mixed origins. The artifacts that tell us the most about the man buried there in Anglo-Saxon England during this period are the helmet, the belt, the Frankish coin collection, the scepter, and the hanging bowl. The helmet, a striking piece found on top of the coffin, can instantly be likened to helmets from Bendel, Sweden. However, the helmet from Sutton Hoo is of superior quality, a sure sign of a flourishing economy on the island at this time. Panels on the helmet are decorated with heroic scenes, such motifs were common in the Germanic world at this time. It is this decorative structure that resembles Swedish style, but the belt basic structure of the helmet is British, consisting of a full face mask with a solid neck guard and deep cheek pieces. These deep cheek pieces have parallels in another English helmet, the Coppergate helmet found in... The question we have to ask ourselves is why is this piece significant? The variety of style incorporated into the helmet, the basic structure being from England and the decorative side being of Swedish origin, shows the continental links that England enjoyed. Also, when looking at the animal scenes on the helmet, there are various symbols that depict the wearer. The heroic scenes suggest that the wearer was a great warrior, and the dragon across the crest of the helmet is a symbol of great strength. Each eyebrow ends in a gilt boar's head. This also represents strength and courage. Like most Anglo-Saxons, the man who was buried at Sutton Hoo wore a waist belt. These were fastened with buckles whose metal and decoration reflected the, wearer, the wealth or status of their owner. From this belt, a knife was normally hung and occasionally a leather pouch to hold personal possessions. The belt buckle is made of gold and is hollow and was made in two parts, joined by a hinge. The locking system in place is very complex, a system of sliders and internal rods which fit into slotted fittings to fill the interior. In belts similar of this type, it was typical to leave a space between the rods so that the wearer could place a small object, a good luck charm perhaps, or an heirloom in their belt buckle. The belt buckle is decorated with writhing snakes and intertwining four-legged beasts. The tip of the buckle shows two animals holding a dog-like creature in their jaws. The hanging bowl was an import from the British living beyond the Anglo-Saxon heartlands. Its present in the grave could indicate the collection of tribute from the British area, or perhaps it was a gift through a marriage alliance. The fact that the hanging bowl is with other exotic imports means that it must have been highly valued. Although it was originally a British item, it must have been in Anglo-Saxon hands for some time. We can tell this because it's been patched with silver as a repair, but the patterns on the silver are of local Anglo-Saxon tradition. It was most likely used for washing after a feast. The scepter is actually not a scepter at all, but a four-sided whetstone, most likely used for sharpening blades. It has individual features, such as portraits of ancestors, which empowers the dynasty of history to which the buried belongs. A stag with a full set of antlers is on the scepter, the stag being a symbol of strength and speed and the king of the forest. This is suggestive of an extremely powerful ruler. Unusually, the whetstone is unused. The Frankish coins were found in a purse dating from the early 7th century. Coins are the best way to date a grave. The coin purse contained 37 gold coins, three coin-shaped blanks, and two small gold ingots. These coin-shaped blanks were added to round the number up to 40. 
The coins were deposited after 595 AD and sometime before 640 AD. All come from the kingdom of the Merovingian Franks, but not any English kingdom, although coin production had started in Kent by this time. The dates of these coins, combined with the location of the grave in East Anglia, suggest that this burial may be that of King Redwald, who died in 625 AD. Along with these items, a sword, a shield, a purslet, and other items were found in Mound 1. They are all of superior quality and portray what an important man was buried there. The symbols present on all of these artifacts, along with their quality and origin, is what makes them, and ultimately the whole site, significant and a very important find. A man standing heroically between two wolves and an eagle swooping down on his prey, for example, are present on the first lid. The wolves could be a reference to the wolfingers, or wolf people, the ancestors of King Redwald. Both the wolves and eagles are a powerful symbol of strength and courage, qualities that a successful leader must possess. Similar images are known from Scandinavia. On the shield, a bird of prey with cruel talons and a six-winged dragon with open snapping jaws symbolizes courage and strength also. The textbook image of Anglo-Saxon migration to Great Britain is seen as three Germanic peoples arriving. They are the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes. The common consensus of their arrival in around 449 to 460 AD was that they arrived in hordes as depicted by Bede. However, recent evidence has come to light to indicate that rather than arriving in ships of hordes, they arrived in small family groups with enough culture to influence the somewhat cultureless Britons. They did this in such a way that their way of life was adopted by the inhabiting tribes. Over time, kingdoms emerged based on where the culture emitting Germanic peoples chose to settle years before. Sutton Hoo is located in the modern county of Suffolk, just north of Ipswich in East Anglia. At the time when the ship was buried, we know that this area of Britain was located in the kingdom of the East Angles. So, naturally we come to believe that given the nature of the Sutton Hoo burial, this type of entombment originated from that of Angleland, where in fact, the bearing of a king of import or important figure within a ship was most commonly done in the region of Scandinavia. So, what we now know is that either people from Scandinavia emigrated to Britain and exerted their culture alongside Germanic tribes, or there were significant cultural links between Jutland and Scandinavia via the modern-day link of the Orison Bridge. However, given the Angled people's seafaring ways and Suffolk and East Anglia being the most direct route to Britain from Scandinavia, it is more likely that this is what really happened. I spoke to Tom Swan earlier from the University of Norwich about his opinion on the certain new ship bearer. The period known as the Dark Ages was awarded its name for good reason, as very little literal or archaeological evidence can be traced back to this time. The Sutton Hoo ship burial was the torch to light up the dark eeriness of the Anglo-Saxon period and gave us great insight into their way of life. It's hard to put into words how significant this discovery really is, as the sheer amount that was found at the Sutton Hoo site is quite extraordinary. Social hierarchy has always been present in life, yet Man 1 helps justify the theory of kingdoms as it has been rumoured to be the final resting place of King Redwald himself. The artefacts themselves, although were forged in England, were made in the Scandinavian Germanic style, of course proving their links to Sweden and Gaul. The way that their burial site was laid out and structured further suggests connections with Sweden. Adopting the burial site of mounds and burying the dead king in the hull, in the hull of the ship. These methods and traditions have never been present in England before the Anglo-Saxon migration so the discovery of the site makes it ever more significant. How no one has stumbled across these mounds before is anyone's guess, but the excavation of the 1930s has become arguably the most important in English history. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank, Thank you. you. And I spoke to Tom Wynn, the councillor for Suffolk. It was an extremely important find, as it confirms that there was an elite immigration coming into Britain. It also means that the theory that Britain was overwhelmed by mass immigration Hence why the Roman and British culture seems overshadowed, is less likely. But it seems now li likely that there was an elite migration that dominated the local people. When we think of the type of burial that Sutton Who is, we must assume that there was a, so a social hierarchy, a Scandinavian technique for the most important in society. Tom, thank you very much. So there you have it. On our journey through the Sutton Who ship burial, we have attained great insight into Anglo-Saxon presence in this period. So join us next week as we analyse the significance of the Battle of Hastings. Goodbye. Goodbye.